hopefully we have Philip and uh, Patrick on the line. Oh, there they are, as if they're by magic. Yeah, they are at work. So I've made you co-host, so you should be able to share your screen in a minute, whoever's got the, the, the uh, presentation. Um, but before that, we have a couple of questions to ask you. Um, was I going first or was you going first, Beth? I could totally uh, love I'll, I'll go first, shall I? Yeah. I think I have. So a question to both of you. Um, what is your favourite or longest medical word that you know that you can tell us? Are you both off mute? Can't hear either. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, it's not a medical one, but it's a science one from A level. I, I, I thought when I started A level, it was smooth endoplasmic reticulum. I like that word. Oh, that's a good one, isn't it? From the uh, so I quite like um, esophageal gastroduodenoscopy. It's like an OGD where you get your camera down the throat. Mm. <laughs> we, don't, we don't really fancy one of those, though, do we? I quite like um, supraventricular tachycardia. <laughs> Deoxyribonucleic acid, isn't it? <laughs> I might have said that wrong. <laughs> DNA. Um, and then the next question was, I, I've, had, I've had some inside information here, but uh, do any of you speak another language, Phil? <laughs> um, so uh, well, I'm from Wales, so we're forced to learn Welsh at school. So we do Welsh. My mum's Italian, so I speak enough Italian to be polite. And in the office, we're learning Spanish at the moment, but my colleagues are much better than I am. Ah, there you go, multilingual. What about you, Patrick? I'm hopeless at languages. I, I only got into a dual stream uh, language uh, set at school uh, because I was good at maths uh, and, <laughs> and science. So I barely got through my O levels in English. Never, and I didn't do any languages. So I think the only thing I can remember is Pencil Creek, which is German for pencil. There you go. That's about it. <laughs> so. Cool. We'll let you guys say a bit about yourselves um, and introduce yourselves. So, uh, Patrick? Uh, yes, I'm a GP in the north of England uh, in uh, Darlington. I also work in uh, in the local hospital trust uh, in doing GP with this uh, with special interest uh, diabetes. And I am one of the bad guys in commissioning, uh, or I'm one of the good guys of the bad guys of commissioning. Um, uh, there's the people who, who, who decide how much to spend on diabetes and other things um, as well. And Philip? Yeah, so I'm a consultant pharmacist for diabetes and endocrinology at Southampton Hospital. And uh, this year I took over as clinical director of our service of the diabetes and endocrine service here as well. Fantastic. Are you there now? It looks like you are. I am, yeah. I'm at work today and tomorrow. Yeah, so just take it a couple of minutes out to have a sandwich and um, jump online. Yeah, yeah. Be the boss, doesn't it? <laughs> right, we'll let, you, we'll let you share your screen and we'll disappear. Uh, cool. so, uh, so I'm going to be doing type 1 diabetes, uh, just a few little snippets, and then Patrick's going to follow me and do some type 2. So I will share my screen, and I'm hoping that we are cooking. Yeah, we Perfect. have it. Okay. Uh, so essentially what I've just put together is a little bit around uh, some of the principles of, of what we're trying to do in type 1 diabetes and a little bit about what's coming forwards and, and you can question for yourself as to whether you think it's going to be useful for you or not. Um, so we've got a little bit of old, a little bit of new. It wouldn't be a type 1 presentation if we weren't discussing insulin. So we're going to start off with... Uh, a few bits about insulin. So it feels like, certainly from my perspective, we have more and more insulins coming to the market. Uh, it does feel a little bit like, you know, so what sometimes? What is the purpose? Why are we having all these different options? Why do we have 60 different varieties of insulin with different names that confuses everyone? Um, when we look over time, you can see that, yeah, the first clinical use of insulin around 1922, the analogues as we know it, for those of you here that now use maybe a basal and a bolus regimen, uh, we're around about the late 90s, so 1996. Long-acting insulin analogs were around about 2000. We had some uh, inhaled insulin that was brought out and withdrawn because the device looked quite dodgy in 2006. But that's now, certainly in the States, you can get an inhaled insulin, which looks like a little bit like an inhaler. We've had ultra-long-acting insulins, concentrated insulins for those that need big doses. And then 
moving forwards, we've also had, you know, ultra fast acting insulins that have now come onto the market. So we've got FIASP. We've also got uh, Troposinil Lispro, which is Limujev, just about to reach the market as well. So these are kind of the next generation of ultra fast acting insulins. And then across the long acting side of the bottom, we've, yeah, the, one of the problems is that I'll discuss in a second, we've kind of got this idea of pegylating insulin. So making it more distributed around the body in a, in a, in a more sensible way. So one of the, the, the things I, you know, I think is really important to touch on is that you know, insulin is a tool at the end of the day, and you really have to appreciate the tool that you're using. And uh, the only way you can get the most out of it is if you understand it, you understand its action, you understand how long it, it takes to act. And also that's the same for the device. You know, For some people, the, a insulin pump is just a tool. If you give an insulin pump to someone, they don't necessarily have better sugars. It's, you have to utilize the tool properly to be able to get the right decisions made to get the right result. And that's a really important thing. You know, there's no such thing as a better insulin. It's about what's right insulin for that person at the right time. Now, what we're aiming to do eventually is get to the point of reaching how fast your insulin comes out of the pancreas with type 1 diabetes. So, you know, this is Nova Rapid here, this dotted gray line. Uh, this is something like Insulatard or, or Humulin I. And then this is Fiasp or some of the newer ones. It's still not as fast as, as your pancreas is able to have its action. But um, what we'll do is we'll show you one of the principles behind all of this. And I think it's really important to remember why we're injecting insulin in the first place. It's not just to get, you know, we've had the carbohydrate talk. We've had some of the bits and pieces. So the insulin is there not just to get the carbohydrate out of your bloodstream and into muscles. It has a really important other function. Now, I want you all to think about, for those that are type 1 in the audience, you know, if you were to take no insulin overnight and you forgot to take it, your blood sugar would be higher in the morning. But you've eaten no carbohydrate. So why is that the case? And it's really important to remember that you know, a, lot of in, a lot of glucose is made in your body in the liver. And one of the roles of insulin is to make sure you stop producing glucose when you don't need it. And so at meal times, the purpose of what you're injecting for is not just to, to kind of utilize the carbohydrate you've just eaten, but also to switch off the glucose production of the liver because you don't need any more sugar. You don't need sugar if you're just about to eat it. So a normal person without diabetes would uh, produce insulin from the pancreas and they'd switch off the glucose in the liver just at the right time for the glucose that you've just eaten in your food to get into the bloodstream and replace it. And so one of the, and it looks, so so it looks like a complicated slide, I promise it's not. Essentially, what I'm trying to show you here is that one of the problems that we've got with injecting insulin altogether is that normally, in someone who had a, a pancreas that was functioning and had insulin production, you would produce insulin and it goes straight into the liver. The first thing it goes into is the liver and it switches off glucose production. And then it gets sent around the body to a lower extent to have all of the other actions that we've discussed on the muscles and, and utilizing the carbohydrate to get energy into the cells. The problem when we inject insulin is we inject it into your periphery, your, 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 your cells, your muscles. It's, it's kind of, it has to go all the way around the body uh, before it gets to the liver. And so, you know, one of the things is that you end up having to use a bigger dose than your pancreas would normally produce. And so all of the cells for the rest of your body end up having more insulin than they technically need because actually the only way to keep the glucose levels post-meal down is to have enough to switch off the glucose in the liver. So essentially, the reason why people gain weight on insulin, and we, you know, it's a known fact, insulin will put weight on you when you start it, is because you're having to use more of it. And you're having to use more of it because it's, it, you have to use a big dose that gets enough around the body and then gets to the liver as well. And it's really difficult. What's also important to remember is that you know, your post-meal glucose levels, so this PPG, post-prandial glucose, um, it contributes to H1C quite a bit. Now, you can see for those that have a high H1C to start with, our focus is always going to be the background insulin, your fast in plasma glucose. And that's because it contributes more towards the H1C at that stage. But as soon as we get down to about 8.5 and below in all percentages or you know, 69 millimoles per mole and below, then actually it's a 50-50 split. And actually down below the 50s, you know, this is kind of you know, just 55, I guess this will be, you know, 70% of that H1C is postprandial. So to improve it further, 
it's all a post meal glucose levels that need to be affected. Um, and this is this is a type two study, but I want just to show you. So the the difference between someone that has diabetes and doesn't have diabetes is actually not necessarily what they've eaten. If you can see, there's there's no real difference here in a healthy person or someone with type two as to what their meal has contributed to their glucose levels. The reason why this person with type two's blood sugars have gone up after the meal is because of the fact that their liver has continued to make sugar. This bit here. So this extra chunk is because of the liver's action. And so straight away, uh, it makes you realize the importance of getting the timing of insulin correctly. And so you're not just timing with the carbohydrate. The reason we're suggesting giving your insulin 15 minutes beforehand, or in the case of using some of the ultra rapid insulins like FIASP, is that you're getting straight to the liver and switching off the production of sugar so it doesn't contribute to your rises after the meal. So timing is so important with mealtime insulins. Um, this is a little bit just to talk about physiologically distributed insulin. So one of the reasons I, you know, I mentioned about the, the, you having to give more insulin than you need is because the whole of your body gets this total dose of insulin. Now, this was an insulin that was discontinued, unfortunately, but there's a few more on, on the way, and it's called Peglispro. And it's got this kind of little chain next to it, which means that when you inject it, it can't get out of the bloodstream. It's too big. And so essentially, it rides that bloodstream all the way around the body, but without affecting the tissue. And the liver breaks it down first of all, which means that you get away with using less insulin. And so the, this, this, the, you know, the original trials with this insulin look a good five years ago now, but it was the first instant where people lost weight when they were switched to it um, because you could use less of it and have the same effect. The, the unfortunate side effect was because it was depositing a little bit too much in the liver, it led to more fatty liver at this stage, so it was discontinued. But there's a, there's a lot more of this going forwards. Okay, so another thing just to mention about is uh, recently there was some data about once weekly insulin. So uh, here we've got insulin ICADEC. Um, and this is the first kind of phase two, which means it's the first in human study of an insulin that's a once a week injection. Um, do I think this is useful for type one? Uh, no, you've had two talks already today, one on exercise, one on the spontaneity of exercise, which explains to you why, you know, in type one diabetes, having an ultra long, super, super long acting insulin that you can't change the dose of is unlikely to be helpful. So it's it's useful for those that maybe are aging with type 1 diabetes and, and need someone else to inject it. And we know that they're definitely going to have a dose in the system. To be honest, most of this is going to be used in type 2. But it's, it's interesting to know where technology has gone. We do have an, a once a week insulin that works and it is as effective as Lantus. But for type 1 diabetes, it does not give you the flexibility that you need for day-to-day -day, uh, you know, lifestyle changes. And that's why, you know, I suspect that most people will be, you know, the technology for diabetes in type one would move more, much more towards pumps and closed loop systems just because of the flexibility of uh, um, being able to bespoke it to that person. Um, I'm gonna skip that slide. Just another interesting point. So it's, it's, there's more of these on the way. It's not just a one-off. So there are two candidates that Lily, the company has both in phase one and phase two, looking at once weekly insulins. Nova Nordis also has an insulin that has once daily, but has benefits to basically complications of diabetes. So it, as, along with the glucose, it helps to prevent retinopathy and nephropathy, so eye disease and kidney disease in diabetes. Um, there's also on the way about to start phase one trials, which is the kind of safety studies, a glucose sensitive insulin. And so this is an insulin where when your blood sugar starts to drop below a particular level, it deactivates and it reduces the risk of low blood sugar by an enormous amount. So the concept of this is fascinating. And so for those, you know, we are, the technology instance is really, really, really moving forwards. Intradermal, worth mentioning. So these are in mouse models at the moment. You'll see that these are micro needles at the end of this finger. Uh, they inject something called smart insulin, which I'll show you. Don't be concerned about this next slide. It is slightly terrifying, but I promise it's not too complicated. Okay, so this bit at the bottom is a bit I want you to focus on. So this is what happens in your glucose meter. So your glucose meter detects hydrogen peroxide. That's how it to tell it kind of tells what the blood sugar is because the amount of glucose then converts with oxygen in the little strip and creates hydrogen peroxide, so bleach. And that hydrogen peroxide is read by the meter, which then gives a corresponding glucose level. Now imagine this is like a gobstopper. 
And all of these needles have lots of these gobstoppers in. And when the glucose goes up, the gobstopper starts to break down because the hydrogen peroxide starts to degrade the little shell. And as soon as the glucose level go down, it reduces the hydrogen peroxide and therefore the gobstoppers stay in shape. So this idea of smart insulin where you can switch on and switch off depending on what your blood sugar is, is again, it's in mouse models. We've seen the data. It's, uh, it'll be interesting to see how long it takes to get to, to human models later on. Not for necessarily the UK, but this is incredibly important. And for me, this is the biggest uh, important thing we can do in, in insulin development going forward. So heat stable insulins. Now, I want you all to imagine when you go on holiday, you know what it's like. You have to store your insulin in, in a cold bag. Uh, sometimes it's if it's been out of temperature for even a couple of hours, the proteins degrade and it doesn't work properly. Um, imagine what it's like in developing countries in the center of Africa where there is no fridges and there's no way to store your insulin. You know, essentially, if you're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, it's an area where there is nowhere that's cold to store your insulin, uh, you do not have a very good chance of survival. And so it's really important just for developing countries to have this idea of heat stable insulins and they're on the way. We've got some early studies of, uh, of ones that are stable past 40 degrees for months. And so they don't need to be stored in a fridge. You can transport them to random islands across the world without them having to be you know, cold storage. Um, also, the potential for this is you also can store the insulin inside your body. So there's the potential for implantable closed loop systems going forwards. Because you know, at the moment, if you were to inject insulin and leave it in a little pocket inside your body, uh, at 37 degrees, it would degrade really quickly. Whereas uh, if you've got heat-stable insulin, this is another way that's potentially moving forwards. A little bit about Minimed. So something for the techies out there. Um, I wasn't sure if many people had seen this, but I'd, I'd put it in anyway. So this was released at the ADA a couple of days ago. Um, so most will know about the Minimed system that's here with the Guardian sensor, and it gets about 71% time in range with some of its augmented uh, loop system uh, guidance and its microbolusin. Uh, we have seen some data for the Minimed 78, uh, 780G, which is the advanced hybrid closed loop system. So the only difference about it really at this stage is the algorithms that it uses in the background. But it does achieve near enough 80% time in range for the goal. And better sensors you'll notice across the bottom. You know, certainly for this sensor in the next 24 months, we've got reduced calibrations and ICGM, which is you know, much better, I think, for everyone. Um, but the idea is you would eventually get to the point of having a personalized closed loop system that is able to also assess for meal handling and other bits and pieces with microbolusin. So we are not far off. What the improvement was over this hybrid closed loop system, which is important for everyone to take away, regardless whether you're on a pump or on injections, so it improved the time in range. So this is the advanced hybrid closed loop system at the top, the red. And this is baseline, and this is on a 670G. So its improvement was all in the middle of the night. And that's how it got the better time in range. And that's how it reduced H1C. So don't forget that you know near enough, 40% of your day is overnight. So unless you get your background insulin correct, it's going to be very hard to get your H1C into range without having the night time sorted. Um, where we go and what the competition is. So we've obviously got the 780G. We've got the Tandem T Slim, which is also you know moving along. We've got a couple of patients that are now on this. But um, essentially, I think that closed loop systems moving forwards are really going to be uh, you know, fascinating to watch how the algorithms change over time. Final thing is a medicine, a tablet for diabetes. So in your kidneys, um, I think I'm not going to spend too much on this because Patrick's going to hopefully talk about this in a second. So in your kidneys, you reabsorb glucose. So glucose, sugar gets into your kidneys, it drags water with it, and then you reabsorb the sugar to make sure that you don't waste energy. Now, we use this medicine in type 2 diabetes, and it blocks the action of this receptor. And so all of a sudden, you stop reabsorbing the glucose and start peeing it out. Um, so in type 2 diabetes, it's a brilliant medicine. It helps with weight loss. There is data and is a license technically in type 1 diabetes. So dapagliflozin at a lower doses can be used in type 1 diabetes uh, with a BMI above 27. And the, the benefits of doing so are a reduction in insulin dose. So you'll see your total daily doses are down by about 10 to 14%. So we'll say 10% down. And therefore, the corresponding change in body weight is down about 3% you know, we'll say in here. So for those with a higher BMI uh, with type 1 diabetes, uh, you can reduce your daily dose of insulin and therefore reduce uh, your, your body weight over time as well. 
there is a downside and there's a reason we were suggesting not using it at the moment during the COVID climate. And that's because it increased the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis and type 1 diabetes. Now, if you've got a BMI below 27, that's a four times increase. So that's 400% increase in the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. And for those that have a BMI above 27, it's still 1.7 times, so 170% increase in your risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. So there is a trade-off, and certainly there's a lot of guidance and, and education that needs to go with it. We've got very few patients in our service on it because of that, that kind of trade-off. And actually, there are other things we can use off-license that have the same benefit without the risk. Um, the final, final uh, the thing I'm going to talk about is immunotherapy. And it's just to mention about where... I guess the aim is to go in terms of not just treating diabetes, but preventing it in the beginning. So I think it's really important to remember that you know, type 1 diabetes is, is a syndrome, not a single disease. We've got patients that get diagnosed at three years old and go on to you know, require you know, insulin straight away. And we've got patients that are 50 and diagnosed and go on for five, six years with type 1 diabetes, with autoimmunity, and they're still producing insulin five years later. So it is a, a cacophony of different individuals with different stories. And actually, the disease state changes over time. So all of you would have had, if you got type 1, a genetic environmental stimulus. Your immune system would have been activated. You would have had a response. You would have developed antibodies. And then you would have had slight changes in your glucose. And then eventually, you would have become insulin dependent. Now, the problem is, is that we are trying to tackle all of those with one brush. And actually, during each of those stages, the treatment might need to be different. Um, importantly, it's not just an autoimmune disease. So your pancreas does other things. It produces glucagon. It produces enzymes and candidate drug selection here. So uh, at the moment, we still use mouse models to try and decide which medicines to try to prevent type 1 diabetes, unfortunately. Uh, just to show you where it would go in and what's in currently being studied. So we've got, here's the immune therapies. And these are the things that we use for multiple sclerosis, for Crohn's, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and they work. They work really well in other immune conditions. Uh, we're really trying to find one that works in type 1 diabetes if you catch a patient early enough. But there's 21 studies that are currently ongoing using different immune therapies and monoclonal antibodies. We've got beta cell encapsulation studies. So these are studies where your beta cells, they use stem cells to kind of make beta cells and then they encapsulate it to protect it from your body's immune system so they can't be degraded. And the other one is just beta cell replacement. So this is using, again, islet cells uh, and replacing the body's normal islet cells. So that is my whistle stop kind of overview of where the future of type 1 diabetes is, both from a cure prevention, from a treatment in uh, injections, and also from technology side. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I've now got to uh, share my screen. Um, so if you just bear with me while I do that. Uh, How's that looking? Is that looking okay? Yeah, we can see. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Now, I appreciate, uh, first of all, that uh, most of the people on this uh, watching this have got type 1 diabetes, and type 2 diabetes is the bit I'm going to be covering. So, uh, but even if it doesn't directly apply to you, it's a common condition. You know, you're looking at about 6% of the adult population who have got this. So, it might be friends, relatives, colleagues, um, you know, loved ones. Uh, so, um, so the first, so mine, I've just broken it up into four sections. There's one about di diagnosis, one a, a little bit about um, uh, uh, um, remission, and then, uh, uh, then there's two sections about drugs. Um, so, uh, so in terms of, yeah, so I'm a GP. So I've been a GP for 20 years, and it's a real challenge to uh, diagnose, certainly accurately, uh, uh, people with uh, diabetes. I, 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 there was a comment actually earlier on, on, it was when Nazareth was talking, but it said, we're all an experiment of one. And, and uh, Phil's just talked about how type one diabetes is a, is a syndrome. It's, it, it, you know, it's a collection of different conditions, probably all presenting as one. And, and certainly type two diabetes is like that. And if we mix them all together, um, uh, you know, it, then it, it, it can get very complicated. And so, Oh, so uh, this this data was presented at uh, at the last Diabetes UK conference in in Liverpool last year, and and there was at the beginning of it there was um, uh, Professor Hattersley, who's uh, uh, down in Exeter, asked the question, uh, "What's 
the difference between an endocrinologist and a diabetologist. And everybody went quiet because nobody wants to look a fool at, particularly with Professor Hadsley, who's bright as a button and uh, nearly as bright as, as our Phil Newland Jones, who's just been on. And, and, and so nobody answered it. And he said, and the answer, of course, was endocrinologists measure hormones. And, and that, that led on, in a sense, to the presentation of a large audit which was based at, at Western General Hospital in Edinburgh. And they looked at all the patients who've got a diagnosis of diabetes uh, who yeah. are on yeah. insulin. And uh, what they found was 20%, so I'll focus on, on patients who had been previously labeled as having type two, but they actually found uh, not dissimilar results in, in people who have been diagnosed with type one, 20% of people get reclassified, but they were reclassified mainly to MODI. Um, if you look at patients who are diagnosed with a, who are on insulin, um, twenty percent of those who are labelled as type two actually, once you're investigated about checking autoimmunity, doing blood tests for their um, uh, for antibodies against GAD and uh, insulin, etc., they and also measure do a test for um, endogenous uh, insulin production. The insulin that someone will be producing themselves by using a C peptide, you can work out whether they've got type one or type two diabetes. And, and what they did, they found was 20% of people actually ha had type one diabetes. So they've been labeled as having type two diabetes, but they actually have got type one diabetes. And, and that's really important because obviously the treatment's very different and certainly the access to technology, et cetera, is quite different. Um, so, and that was particularly true in those patients who were on insulin within um, three years of diagnosis. So if you've got a friend or a colleague who's, who's got, who has been labeled as having type two diabetes and on insulin within three years of diagnosis, and, and Phil has already pointed out, it can actually even be longer than that, but particularly that three year um, is quite sensitive. They, they're definitely worth asking uh, their GP or, 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 or their uh, nurse to, to whether they need their diagnosis reviewing. Remission. So, so this is when, so again, we're talking about type 2 diabetes here. So it's when people have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Can they get rid of it? Can they get rid of the harms associated with it? And, and we've known for a while that's probably the case. And last year, uh, there was a, a consensus statement made by the ABCD, that's the Association of British Clinical Diabetologists, and the Primary Care Diabetes Society, um, PCDS, of which I'm a committee member. And, and the, they suggested that if you fulfill three criteria, then you can uh, uh, have remission of, of diabetes. And they were... Uh, uh, one was um, weight loss, two was achieving normal or, or below the diabetes threshold uh, levels of glucose, so uh, fasting glucose uh, below seven or, or uh, HbA1c below 48 at six months and being uh, 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 sustained during that whole of that time at least. Um, and they also need to be off, off all their glucose lowering medications. And the advantage of that remission is not just in terms of their health, but also in terms of insurance, they can actually um, get uh, some benefits in terms of reduced insurance costs. Um, so, uh, and we've known, as I said, for, for some time that bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery can achieve that. But more recently we've found that dietary methods particularly low calorie or low carb approaches can achieve this. And the magic number is 15 kilograms. So they have to lose 15 kilograms. So it's not a walk in the park, but appropriately motivated people, particularly if, it, if it's within seven years of diagnosis, we've found this to be particularly effective. And, and it's probably best um, that the most famous study looking at this is the direct study, which was done up uh, just a little bit further north, 45 minutes up the A1 from where I live right now which is uh, and, and made famous by the Newcastle diet. So Roy Taylor, professor up there, and, um, and Alison Barnes, who's a, a specialist dietitian. And they, and you can read more about that if you've got friends or people or you, you yourself have got type 2 diabetes, by all means, just either Google it or follow this. And if you want um, any links on here, we, the presentation I'm sure we can provide. Um, so type 2 diabetes 
that one of the challenges with type 2 diabetes, so yes, people are diagnosed because of their glucose, but what they don't, they don't die of diabetes complications. They die of cardiovascular diseases and other conditions, actually. Uh, often a lot of those other conditions can be related to weight, but, but the leading cause tend to be cardiovascular diseases. So heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, those sorts of things. And um, the problem we have here in terms of the guidelines, which direct um, healthcare pr practitioners across England, Northern Ireland, and Wales, is they're working on NICE guidance, which is now five years since it was published, last published, and it's out of date. So a lot of the studies I'm just going to briefly touch upon uh, in the remainder of this presentation is it weren't around at that time when they were writing these guidelines. The Scotland have adopted many of these because they fortunately had, uh, updated theirs more recently. But what I would suggest, anybody who's got type 2 diabetes or, 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 or looking after people or, or, or bothered about people who've got type 2 diabetes need to look at the ADA, American uh, Diabetes Association, EASD, a European Association of Study Diabetes Physician Statement, which is updated on an annual basis. And um, you can free, freely read that um, there because I think only by knowing what treatments are available. If you do need drug treatments, and I've, I've already identified that, not everybody needs drug treatments, um, but if they do need drug treatments, then, then um, there, are, there are differences in how we manage them. And that's particularly because we know lowering glucose in type 2 diabetes prevents microvascular complications, eye problems, kidney problems, but it, it, do, it has a, only a modest impact on, on, on actually a, a reducing the things that kill or really harm people as they as they get older. So I won't go, Phil fortunately covered this bit. So sodium SGLT2 inhibitors, he's told us how that works. And um, so, um, and it, I suppose the important thing is when we're talking about some of the things I'm gonna be talking about just uh, next, is that it's not just about glucose. So sodium glucose transporters, so yes, you're peeing out glucose if you block this SGLT2 here. Um, so this is where the, the, fil the blood gets filtered, as, as Phil has said. And normally, and if you're blocking glucose uh, absorption, you're peeing out glucose. So you get the benefits in terms of weight loss um, and uh, uh, glucose lowering because of that. You also get the side effects, which uh, thrush is one of the side effects, for example. But if you block um, this sodium glucose co-transporter, you also block sodium. And that seems to have quite magical effects in, in terms of uh, the body. And also you change the way the body deals with um, uh, substrates. It normally uses glucose as a substrate, but you can start changing over to ketone bodies, which in type two diabetes is generally pretty safe and, and actually may lead on to some of the benefits. So what are the benefits of these drugs? So they, they lower glucose as the others, but the clinical, there was a whole bunch of clinical trials which compared these newer therapies with old therapies. And what do they show? So patients with AS, ASCVD, so that's atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, people with circulatory problems in the legs. This is type two diabetes, but what did it do? They reduced, but some of these things may apply in type one diabetes. And Phil has suggested, perhaps not right now, but, but you know, these agents may have some benefits. But what we've, we know is they reduce the risk of death if we use empagliflozin. Um, in one study showed us they also was a trend to reduce heart attacks and they actually reduced overall mortality. It wasn't just cardiovascular mortality. Um, so dapagliflozin, what about people who don't have those conditions? Only minority people with type 2 diabetes have had these events. Most people haven't. 80 plus percent of people haven't. So, but if you're a man over the age of 55, a woman over the age of 60, and you have got one additional risk factor, that is high cholesterol, being on a statin, having high blood pressure or having your blood pressure treated or smoking, then you, you would classify as multiple risk factor. And we know by these drugs compared to the older drugs, you can stop people going into hospital with heart failure, uh, 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 which is not that uncommon. Uh, we know within five years of a diagnosis of type two, type two diabetes, people are already developing problems with their heart. Um, not only can it prevent people getting uh, going into developing heart failure, the people who've got established heart failure, and this is people with type two diabetes, actually people who don't have diabetes at all, all, um, it, it can be a treatment for a type of uh, heart failure called uh, uh, heart failure reduced ejection fraction, again, reducing mortality from cardiovascular diseases. 
canagliflozin has been shown in diabetic kidney disease to delay people going on to dialysis, delay people uh, um, having end-stage renal disease, and again, dying from cardiovascular diseases, which once you develop diabetic kidney disease, be it type 1 or type 2, this is in the type 2, con type two diabetes context. We know that cardiovascular diseases are more harmful uh, or more, more common. So looking after people completely is, is important in those times, particularly their heart. GLP-1 receptor analogs, there was a question about, is this uh, ready for type 1 diabetes? I'm just talking about type 2, but just very briefly mentioning the type 1 thing. So it may have some benefits in the honeymoon period, because, but these drugs um, uh, do uh, improve uh, insulin production, endogenous insulin production in insulin production from uh, a pancreas, but you do need to have a functioning pancreas for, it, for them to work in that sense. But the benefits of these, and they come as once daily or once weekly, I've got the brands on there, um, um, they lower glucose. So, and they're very effective glucose lowering. In fact, as MPIC, probably the most effective of these, can drop people's HbA1c on average by, you know, 15 to 20. So it's a, a which is a very effective treatment compared to double what we would see with most tablets. Um, and it, they have effects on weight. So again, as MPIC, you, you, on average, about six and a half kilograms in weight loss. So um, a stone in weight. And they have a low propensity for uh, hypoglycemia. Um, so they don't cause hypos. They've been shown in high-risk patients to reduce stroke, heart attacks, and death. Harms, they cost quite a bit of money. So we have to be a bit careful. I don't know if Partha Carr's watching this, but if he is, he doesn't want me to to, to uh, give too many of these out because we've got to spend money on other treatments, including uh, technology for type one, for example. They, they're not always brilliantly tolerated in the first two to three months. And because they're very good at dropping glucose lowering, they drop and um, they can cause worsening of retinopathy in some, for those patients who already got retinopathy. And that's what the one of the pens looks like. I won't go on too much about it, but they're very easy to use. That's an auto injector. You don't even need to stick a needle on it. It's, it's basically, well, I will talk briefly about it because they're, they're a fantastic bit of kit. You just remove that bung, you switch. There's a little click there. You switch it from red to green, the safety lock, put it on your tummy, press that green button for about 10 seconds. You get two clicks. One click, the needle goes down, in, injects it. The second click, the needle's out. And that's it done for a whole week. So the latest thing in terms of GLP-1 is from the 3rd of August next month, we're going to have a, a, a tablet. So first tablet, Rebelsis, dreadful name, but it's a very good drug. And it's, um, so, but it's going to be a fiddly drug to take. It's every day, but you need to take it on an empty stomach. You can't have, you've got to have it with half a glass, 120 mils worth of water. You can't eat for at least 30 minutes. And if you don't do that, it just doesn't work. So if you have a, an espresso, if you have an orange juice, if you start eating a bit early, it just doesn't work because the, the, these are hormones, large peptides, which um, your body will just digest as food. So there, there's some clever stuff called snack, which helps it be absorbed and protects it from the enzymes in your stomach uh, and the acid in your stomach to break it down. Anyway, that's all briefly uh, I was going to cover. Cool. Um, so we've got tons of questions, but like with everyone else, we'll just ask you a couple each. Um, so Phil, one for you, quite a lot of talk in the chat about FIAS. Um, do you think that everyone with type one should just be given a trial of FIAS? Do you think it's only for certain people? Um, some people saying, you know, they get it really easy in their area and then other people saying they can't get it. Um, what, what your yeah, thoughts? so I think... I think with the ultra rapid insulins, it, it does depend on the the sort of food that you eat in reality. So um, it's I would say it's it's not fantastic for really fatty meals because of the fact it does work uh, incredibly fast. So it, unless you're kind of you know quite good at already splitting your doses for really fatty meals, um, we it does increase the risk of having a hyper within the first hour post meal if you don't know what you're doing with the glycemic index and the carb counting so to be utilizing it you know, properly you really have to be on top of carb counting and glycemic index to, to, to get the maximum benefit out of it but um if that's the case and it you know we know it reduces your hmc just by switching across for those with the good knowledge of that it by about 0.4.5 percent so it's um it is useful i wouldn't say it's for everyone um but it, it can be a useful tool when you know how to use it 
Yeah. What What are your thoughts on people like using it for um, specific meals? So we've got some patients that we see that use it, say, just for breakfast or for things like that. Or maybe if they're shift workers, they will just use it when they're on a certain shift or things like that to be able to manage their glucose better when they're doing those sorts of activities. And then they would use their Nova Rapid maybe or whatever for the other meals in the day. Yeah, yeah. So I've got, I've, I've, as you say, I've got a couple of those actually that use the breakfast and uh, lunchtime when they, they're less set on exactly what time they're going to be able to have it and they can't necessarily inject 15 minutes beforehand. Um, that's that's quite good. And in the evening, um, some people use um, yeah, Nova Rapid instead or, or just Humalog instead or whatever. So it's, um, yeah, there's, you know, as I said, it, there's different solutions for every single person. I don't think there's any set thing just to say every person should have this insulin. Yeah. Okay, so I've got some questions for Patrick. Um, so I'm going to merge them. All. There's three questions that are quite similar, so I'm going to merge them, try and merge them all into one. Um, so what is the best blood test, GAD or C-peptide? Why are we not offering it to everyone? And if you've had it for over 30 years, is it worth doing the tests? So, um, well, there are four different autoantibodies to use. One of them is GAD. So now, interestingly, in some countries, so in um, Sweden and in Finland, they routinely work people up when they're diagnosed. They routinely will check those four autoantibodies and the C-peptide. So it's none of this sort of, do you look like you've got type 2 or do you look like you've got type 1 diabetes, which is currently what we're doing. And, you know, I should probably, and, and sometimes we use weight as a bias. We use age and weight. And the problem is the average BMI in the UK is 28. So just if someone's a bit overweight, doesn't mean they've instantly got type 2 diabetes. They may have type 1 diabetes. It's got, you know, so we know both are going up. Uh, both are becoming more common. So it, it isn't easy is the honest answer. If you get it wrong, you know, it. well, we all know people can die of type 1 diabetes. You get it wrong. I mean, we've certainly had someone locally, even in the last six months, end up on ITU because they got it, someone got it wrong. And um, nobody tries to make a mistake, but but it happens. So I don't, I think in terms of those autoantibodies, I wouldn't say one is better than another. The C-peptide measures something completely different. Autoimmunity can go, absolutely. It can be present and gone. So that after 30 years, it may be still positive, but uh, a GAD in particular, which is the slow burn, GAD is the slow burn one. So the, some people have uh, heard of, of Lada, which isn't a, a rubbish old uh, car. It's it's latent autoimmune of diabetes of adulthood or type one and a half. And it's, it's uh, these people who often present maybe like type two diabetes, maybe even look to respond to some of the treatments we use initially because they would do. Um, but then they end up on insulin relatively quickly. Um, uh, but, but not within weeks, they're in years. Um, that, that, so, so that tends to be around persistent a little bit longer, but, but I would, but the C peptide would be useful at any, at any stage if, in that uh, case, because if you've got type two diabetes, you should still have a degree of, of, of insulin production. But the, the, the difficult thing, if you've had diabetes for 30 years, if being on insulin or not, you, actually the, the, the progression of type two diabetes probably means you end up with very, very little production of insulin anyway. I don't know if I've answered the question or just rabbited on for a bit, but I, I, I understood it. <laughs> I'm not sure if everyone else did. Okay, um, but but I think that uh, why is it not all being done? That's a very good question. They're relatively expensive. This is relatively specialised. So I talked about Sweden and Finland. That endocrinologists deal with all of those, and maybe as we're if perhaps in the future, maybe we've got more specialists involved in the early assessment of people. Maybe we will get better at diagnosing people and getting the right treatment. One of my biggest bugbears is when people are getting the wrong treatment and have got the wrong diagnosis. So that's why there's probably, there may be people, certainly there's people out there, if you go looking for them, you will change their diagnosis and that gives them an opportunity to get the right treatment. And if, you know, if, if you've got type one diabetes, you need better, you need, well, not better, but you need different treatment than type two diabetes because your body doesn't produce its own insulin. So, you know, you need to be carb counting, you need to be having access to technology, um, et cetera. Okay. There's just one, a question that's just come up here. As Patrick mentioned, Andrew Hattersley, can I mention that Imperial are looking at Modi in the black community and South Asian population, looking at people diagnosed under the age of 30? Uh, it's not really a question, it's more of a 
point. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, I think it's it's a good comment. I mean, the, what I would say, it's very, we're, 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 black lives do matter. In terms of research, when it comes to Modi, it's been mainly white Caucasians because that's just the people who live in the Southwest. Um, but, but you know, but I think we are getting better at looking at, at, at uh, this with people with different ethnic backgrounds. Yeah. A question that did come up um, earlier on was, do you guys know how people can get involved in these trials and things? Because, you know, like with new insulins and medicines and things. Yeah, so I think the majority of specialist centres are research active. And there's still, there's actually quite a few community providers that are starting to do more uh, research in the community is so you know specialist derived services that have teamed up with GP surgeries there's yeah I think a reasonable amount of GP surgeries that are now research ready and are kind of ready to accept these these sort of joint um, research trials with specialist care um, but yeah it, it all dwells in getting the right diagnosis to start with you know you can't uh, can't do it without that unfortunately. 